हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम भयम भयमत्मनि भूष्टोम क्षाम नारायणम नमस्कृत्य नाम चैव नरोत्तम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुदीरायत बिफोर रिसाइडिंग विश्रीमाद भागवतम वी शुरू फॉर आर रिस्पेक्ट फ्लो बेसिंसेस अंडर द पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड एट लॉर्ड नारायण अंतु नारायण नारायण ऋषि द सुप्रीमोस ह्यूमन बीइंग अंतु मदर सरस्वती द गॉडेस ऑफ लर्निंग एंड अंतु श्रील व्यास देव द ऑथर सो दिस मॉर्निंग वी रीडिंग फ्रॉम टेक्स्ट 26 चैप्टर 18 पितु महाराज मिल्क्स द अर्थ प्लैनेट कैंटो 4 ट्रांसलेशन द प्लैनेट अर्थ supplied everyone his respective food during the time of king prithu the earth was fully under the control of the king thus all the inhabitants of the earth could get their food uh, supply by creating various types of calves and putting their particular types of milk in various pots purport this is evidence that the lord supplies food to everyone as confirmed in the vedas eko bahunam yo bididhati kama Although the Lord is one, he is supplying all necessities to everyone through the medium of the planet Earth. There are different varieties of living entities on different planets. They all derive their eatables from their planets in different forms. On the basis of these descriptions, how can one assume that there is no living entity on the moon? Every moon is earthly being composed of the five elements. Every planet produces different types of food according to the needs of its residents. According to the Vedic Shastras it is not true that the moon does not produce food or that no living entity is living there Sarve sva mukhya vatsena sve sve patre putak paya sarva kama dugam prithvim dududhu priti apritu bhavitam The planet earth supplied everyone with his respective food during the time of king prithu the earth was fully under the control of the king Thus all the inhabitants of the earth could get their food supply by creating various types of calves and putting their particular types of milk in various pots. Mukam karoti bachalam pangam langayate ganim yat kripata daham bande shri guru dina tarinam. So uh, as I indicated yesterday uh, I thought I would take the opportunity because the purport mentioned something about beings on other planets <laughs> i thought i would uh comment today on some of the ideas that are floating around in the ether about well about so many things anyway uh so to understand uh the uh why these different ideas about uh UFOs coming down and one world conspiracy and all these different theories <clears throat> to understand why that's happening we have to understand uh the situation today in this modern age we know kali yuga we know this age as the age of kali the age of quarrel confusion spiritual darkness So Bhakti Vinod Thakur has uh, written in the Hari Nam Chintamani uh an interesting observation. He said that in the age of Kali more and more people uh take up a religious process which is generally known as tantra. And this is ha- occurring all over the world. Now we should explain what is this tantra. So tantra uh is a word it actually means means different things the word means book uh like there's a book called pancha tantra the five books of stories so in general tantra means book but in in a particular context this this word book is indicating a certain kind of scripture called agama uh so agama means that which comes down through some very esoteric tradition Hare Krishna 
I am not comprehending this morning's schedule. I'm just giving this class. I don't know what's happening now. <laughs> huh? Oh, really? I was told the class can be as long as I want. Oh, okay. This is a, this is also tantra, esoteric knowledge. <laughs> no one really knows what's going on. <laughs> anyway. So Agama, Agama, that which comes down, this is uh, tradition, uh, esoteric tradition of knowledge. Now even in, even in our uh, uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, there is Agama, Tantra. But it is in the uh, transcendental mode of goodness, Vasudev Sattva. But from this uh, Vaishnava Agama, we get the whole uh, tradition of deity worship, uh -huh. Pancharatra. So, you know, because you can inquire into why is it that we do these things in just this way, in Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. And then you see in other Sampradayas, they do deity worship in, in different ways. They may have different mantras, different rituals. Why is it like that? And that's all uh, Agama. It's, it's not something you can pin down really uh, in Veda. Uh, Agama, tradition, a little esoteric. Anyway, we accept it because uh, we receive our uh, uh, Vaishnava Tantra or Pancharatra from Acharyas, their fully Krishna conscious, realized souls. So their instructions on this matter we can accept. But now this uh, term Tantra is generally applied to the Agama or esoteric tradition in the mode of ignorance. Generally, that's whenever you heard the, hear the word Tantra being used, you see books in the bookstores talking about Tantra. They're talking about mode of ignorance. So this is worship, not of Vishnu, as we are doing, Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Nityananda. But that type of Tantra is worship of Maya. Uh, and in India, it is called the uh, Shakta tradition. Uh, worship of Goddess Durga. So in this uh, Shakta Tantra, there are two divisions. One is called Dakshina Marg, and one is called Vama Marg. Dakshina Marg means the right-hand path, Vama Marg means the left-hand path. Now in the right-hand path, uh, Durga Devi is wor worshipped in temples, in her forms, uh, according to some set procedure, puja procedure, they follow rules and regulations. And the whole point of that, of course, there's many things going on. Uh, uh, worship for, you know, benediction, receiving benedictions, people are coming and making offerings and praying for different kinds of material benedictions. That's all going on in the right-hand path. And the priests uh, have are supposed to have clairvoyant powers. They get from Goddess Durga and they can tell the future. You know, you, you have some problem, he can tell you how it will be resolved in the future and so on. He can tell you so many things. Uh, this is especially seen, this type of right-hand tantra is very prominent in South India and uh, in Malaysia where a lot of South Indians have gone. This is very, very big thing. So anyway, uh, now the whole point of this right-hand path of Tantra, the, ult the ultimate, you can say the Vedic goal of it, the progressive goal, is just to come to the point to see every, that every man sees every woman as mother, and every woman sees every man, except, her, except husband and wife we're talking about, outside of husband and wife relationship. The men are seeing women as mother, and the mother is seeing men as son. That's the whole point of it, because it, they're... Worshipping Durga Devi as the Supreme Mother. And uh, then uh, females, female human beings are representatives of Durga Devi. So they're uh, the same mother principle. And uh, the men are the sons like that. So we, this, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, <laughs> step one. This is kindergarten bhakta program. <laughs> the first day. <laughs> we tell the bhaktas 
you know, you must see the women as your mother, and we tell the Bhaktins, you must see the men as your son. In this, in this way, uh, we can go on in a social setting as devotees, just like here, men and women together, serving Krishna. And naturally there, is, there must be some relationship between men and women. We cannot pretend that, you know, the other half of the temple is just not there. You know? <laughs> it's impossible. So there has to be some kind of relationship. But this is the proper relationship. If one is not married, then one should see... That's why we refer to the ladies as Madhiji. Mother. So there's this whole, you know, right-hand tantric path, you know, to, with all this weird stuff going on. <laughs> Just to bring people to that point. Then they're advanced, actually. They're, they're, they're advanced in that right-hand tantra when they finally understand that... Uh, Every woman is my mother. Every woman represents Durga Devi, except my wife. So all that big to-do just to come to that point, which we say on the first day in Krishna consciousness. So then, then there's a left-hand path. Now this is, this is more relevant to what's going on today all over the world. The left-hand path, actually the whole thing, the whole, this whole... Uh, uh, worship of Maya, it's all in the mode of ignorance. But the left-hand path is especially in the mode of ignorance. And that's where they're not considering Durga Devi as mother. But rather, the worshippers are considering themselves to be Shiva. Shivoham, I am Shiva. And that means Durga is my consort. So in this mood, they worship Durga Devi. And so out of this whole tradition, it, it gets really bizarre, it... Uh, there's no limit to, to how it unfolds. And that's where you get all this uh, uh, sex yoga. You know, there's so many books in these New Age bookstores here in Copenhagen about tantric sex. So, in, in this way, the, uh, the man is representing Shiva, the woman is representing Durga, and they combine in some sex yoga. And they're supposed to get some enlightenment from this, you know. <laughs> Weird things going on. That's one example. Another, another thing out of this left-hand tantric tradition, uh, tradition is something, uh, something like voodoo. Actually, you can say voodoo is a, is a because this is all over the world. So voodoo is another form of it. In fact, in fact, in Haiti where they practice voodoo, they even call their priests the priests who put spells on people and all these things, these you know, who make people into zombies. They call them in their language bokor which means the priest who uses the left hand. And in India, you know, so many thousands of miles away, they're calling these same kind of tantrics, Vama Margis, left hand. So, you know, you can see it's all over the world. And so they're into summoning up ghosts and evil spirits, which are all the shaktis of, of the uh, horrible forms of Durga, like Kali, Chamunda, and so on. So, uh, and also... Uh, horrible forms of Shiva too, Kala Bhairava. So they have their their ghostly, their ganas, ghostly associates. And so these tantrics, they summon them and they, you know, get powers from them. And So so many things are going on in this left-hand tantric tradition. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur has said that uh, this religion, in the mode of ignorance, tantra, is becoming the dharma of Kali Yuga, becoming the general religious path everywhere around the world. So now when we speak of Dharma, uh, there are three phases. There's always three phases of Dharma. And that we know from Prabhupada's books. Very uh, basic information. Uh, karma, Jnana and Bhakti. Uh, in Vedic Dharma, we find there are these three phases. There's some people who take Vedic Dharma in, the, as the, uh, in mentality of karmis. So they understand Vedic Dharma in that way. And then there's the Jnanis. They have their understanding. And then there's the devotees. They have their understanding. So uh, that is also going on in this mode of ignorance Dharma. And we see this in the Western world. You have, um, uh, as an example of the Karma phase, you have the materialists. Prabhupada clearly says the materialistic scientists are shaktas. He clearly says that. I know of two purports in Srimad Bhagavatam where Prabhupada says like that. The materialistic scientists are an example in the Western world of shaktas, of worshippers of the material energy. Uh, but 
Their approach is, you can say, naturalistic. Uh, they're uh, they're under, understanding everything as material energy and uh, uh, there's no soul. Consciousness is just a creation of material combination. We're just products of nature and we should just be natural. So their whole scientific investigation is aimed at establishing uh, what they think is some kind of uh, a better harmony with nature. So in the schools, that's why in the schools, you know, these, these uh, uh, scientists and educators have established this uh, sex education for, you know, children <laughs> seven years old, <laughs> nine years old like that. Teach them how to have sex because it's natural. And like that. So that's going on. So in this way, everyone can be, you know, just like they're studying in order to formulate their naturalistic philosophy, they're studying rats and, and, uh, and other creatures. They're letting them run through mazes and giving them drugs and seeing what they do, all this stuff going on. And from this, they draw the conclusions about how human beings behave. So then their principles they are establishing in society is simply to make human beings into animals. They think that's natural. So that's the karma phase. Uh, materialism, naturalism. Then there's the jnana phase, which is another kind of philosophy, uh, which is called functionalism. Now this is a this is a bona fide term coming from the scientific world. This is another ki- class of scientists. They're called functionalists, and they're they're in they're into consciousness. The materialists are not really into consciousness as a as a uh, uh, ingredient or as an element, they pretty much ignore it. Uh, they're just looking at at, uh, at the body. But these functionalists, they're into consciousness, but they understand consciousness in a quite material way. Their analogy is a computer program. Uh, so this is where this term functionalism comes. That uh, you know, just like you have a in a computer, your diskette with a program. And that's to perform a particular function. You have your computer, you stick the disk in, and then you get a program. And then you can do something. And then when you want to do something else, you change the program. So this is how they understand functionalism. Uh, This is how they understand consciousness, in terms of function. They admit that there's consciousness, but it's a very materialistic understanding of it. So, but it leads to interesting conclusions about reality that if uh, consciousness is programmable, then reality is also programmable. In other words, you can have different realities. You see, this, this is actually the, the Mayavadi, the real Mayavadi aspect, this functionalism. That uh, according to a person's uh, consciousness, consciousness that's been programmed into his head, then he will perceive the world in a certain way. And that's real. For him, this is this is the functionalist philosophy. That's real, and someone else can perceive it in another way, and that's also real. And ultimately, it's all one. So there, there are scientists uh, who are who are getting into this functionalism. They're studying consciousness, uh, but they have very materialistic aims. And uh, the whole new age, this whole new age movement, is coming out of this. Uh, they're into alternate realities and uh, all these things. Uh, another thing that's coming out of this, because it all st- really had a m- big mushroom in the 1960s, the hippie movement. So the new age came out of the hippie movement. The new science came out of the hippie movement. Also, uh, the drug culture. This is another form of functionalism. You know, according to the drug you take, then you shift into another reality. So this is the drug heads are also functionalists, and not only that, the pornographers, pornography is also another. It's a kind of destructive phase of functionalism, because these functionalists they're mayavadis. So some are constructive, some are looking at changing reality in a positive way, and others are nihilists. They just want to break everything down, make it void, make it to nothing, and that's uh, these pornographers are doing like that, because. Uh, sex, sex life is a very uh, destructive, powerful force. 
And uh, uh, if it is unleashed on society, you know, propagated like that, it will break everything down. And that's what these uh, pornographers are doing. They have a philosophy of ridiculing the whole, they're ridiculing the whole uh, uh, setup of society, all this, the serious uh, goal-oriented, what you call goal-oriented uh, activity, you know, going to work, uh, earning money, building up society. They ridicule it with their pornography. Uh, and they're encouraging people to simply surrender to sex impulse under any circumstances, doesn't matter. <laughs> This is what pornography depicts, you know, sex life on the job, sex life in the hospital. They have all these different kinds of movies about these things. They, they make these fantasies. And so the whole thing is just to, just to break down everyone's conception of reality. Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> this is functionalism in different phases. And then you have the dualists. This is the third, this is the... Uh, degraded bhakti, degraded bhakti. It's coming right out of uh, Christianity and uh, Jude Judeo-Christianity. They call it the Jewish and Christian tradition. So dualism, dualism means there's some idea of spirit and matter duality, but actually it's it's framed in terms of good and evil. You know, God and Satan, like that. So they understand two principles. The functionalists bring it down. They, 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 there's only one principle. They're real mayavadis. And the materialists are just materialists. They're simply seeing the material energy. So uh, the dualists, Judeo-Christians, um, they are... Uh, 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 yes, they're trying to establish their own you know sense of morality on this world they have their they have their own agenda um, one thing that's interesting oh yes yeah what I wanted to say is it was just slipping my mind they're also tantrics this is what I wanted to do some some people may think well what what does Christianity have to do with tantricism it's definitely it's really heavy tantra but it's more like this right hand path but you see you know because the original form of Christianity in Europe is Catholicism, Roman Catholic Church. So you look at the rituals in the Roman Catholic Church, they're tantric, purely tantric. They're worshipping the mother, Maria. So this is a tantric conception. And how do they worship her? With wine. <laughs> and this is going on in India. <laughs> they worship Durga Devi. And, and not only that, Maria is a virgin. And this is also in... in, in uh, there's, a, there's a division of tantric practice in India called Uttara Kaula where they worship virgin girls with wine and, and she's symbolizing you know the universal mother so this is this is <laughs> this is right there in the Catholic Church they have a whole liturgy ritual everything <laughs> the priests are you know doing their things they have their wine and they're drinking at different times you know they have to drink the wine because they're receiving the mercy of uh, whoever it is <laughs> so at a certain time of the ritual they have to drink Chanting mantras, the whole this is tantra, this is tantra. Uh, and then, then there was, you know, then there was a split. Uh, the Protestant religion uh, rebelled against this, but uh, you know they rebelled against all those rituals. But they themselves developed another kind of tantra, and that's like, uh, like you see in this uh, Freemasons, you know. The Masons, they have a very esoteric... This is, this is all coming out of the Protestant tradition. In Italy, all the Protestants, they become Masons because the Catholic Church is so powerful. There's always been a, a conflict between Protestants and Catholics, so it manifests in that way. That the Protestants become Masons and they have in their Masonic lodges their own secret rituals. And it's all Tantric also. Very clearly Tantric. They even have the... Anyway, I shouldn't get into these things. <laughs> I won't say. <laughs> but really, really tantric stuff. So, uh, yeah, these are, the, these are the dualists. Good, evil. And, and they're... Um, uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll come back to this point. Um, what I want to say is that 
As we see in, in India, in the history of India, there have been many cults that have come out in the Kali Yuga. The Tantric cults, the Buddhist cults, the Jain cults. They're all different varieties of the same thing. And every one of these cults, they have their own Purana and Itihasa. Just like in the original tradition, the Vedic tradition, there is Purana and Itihasa. That means histories, stories to illustrate their point of view, to defend their point of view. Uh, they always refer to some story. Uh, so all these cults in India, they had their own, like the Buddhists had their Jataka stories, and the Jains have their stories, and the Tantrics have their stories. Uh, so in the West also, all the, these different groups in the karma phase, jnana phase, bhakti, perverted bhakti phase, they have their own histories and stories and explanations of things. Now this is where you get this conspiracy business comes out of this. Now, I, I'm referring today, you know, there's conspiracy theories today about how the whole world is being controlled by the Rockefellers or, or the Rothschilds or the somebody like that. Some mysterious figures, a few, you know, round table of nine families or something, richest families in the world, and they're pulling all the strings and, uh, you know, west and east, Everyone's under their control and they're just getting more and more control. So this is nothing new. These conspiracy theories uh, can be traced all the way back uh, to uh, in the West. We can trace them back, well, way, 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 way back actually. But, but for our purposes, it's convenient to start with uh, the story of Jesus. So, you know, Jesus was betrayed by the Jews, that was a conspiracy. And he was hung on the cross, but he came back to life, all of that. And then in, soon after uh, 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 Christ, then there came various struggles. In the church there was struggles between the Christians and the Jews. The Christians accused the Jews of having conspired to murder Jesus. So this, this whole thing has come down to the present day. There's always been a, a constant conflict between those two camps. There was conflicts between different camps of Christians also in the early days. And each one accusing the other of conspiracy, trying to take over. And this, is, uh, this has just come down, down through history. It's called actually the philosophy of history. Uh, that, that we're evolving, struggling. History is a struggle, an evolution. Evolving to a certain point. This, this is all arising out of Christianity. According to these Christian dualists, the point, the final point of evolution will be the triumph of good over evil when Christ comes back. So they explain this whole, and they're all their conspiracy theories in this term. You know that right now the world is being ruled by satanic forces. They've taken over. And only those who have the, you know, this, this secret insight that we're giving can be saved from these satanic forces. And soon Jesus will come back and then the satanic forces will be defeated and all those who are on the side of the satanic forces, knowingly or unknowingly, they'll be, you know, they'll enter the lake of fire or whatever. <laughs> and then only the, the true Christians who knew what was going on, they'll inherit the earth. So this is the dualistic version of the conspiracy theory. And you must know, as I said, it goes, it goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The, these theories you, you see today are simply transformations, modern transformations of theories that existed back in the Middle Ages and even before. Uh, so it's nothing new. And therefore it's nothing to really get upset about. <laughs> it's nothing to think like, wow, what's going on? Because these same theories have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Then the functionalists or the, the Mayavadis, the Gnostics, this, the, the Jnana phase, the Jnanis, they also have their theory of history and conspiracy and so on. But they say the triumph will be oneness. Not in good over evil, but just oneness, realization of oneness. That we're all one and there is no good and evil like that. And then the materialists, they have their philosophy of history. And that's evolution, Darwinism. The human being will gradually evolve you know, to some super race master of the universe like that. So, then, 
Now, what about this uh, conspiracy theory? Is there something to it? Yes, there is. Very simply, it is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam what the real conspiracy is. Because if you, you know, you talk to these people, like that person Ananda was here, speaking about one world government, and they have some evidence that they give. Now a lot of this evidence is, is garbage, speculation. But some of it is correct or partially correct. And they, they definitely are seeing something. But what is the real conspiracy? That has been explained in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's the personality of Kali. Personality of Kali, uh, 5,000 years ago, launched, uh, launched a plot to take the earth from Maharaj Pariket. That's right there, you can read it. Every, we all know the story, how he did it. And we know uh, Kali's means for uh, seducing people away from the Vedic path. It's the four principles of Adharma, four principles of sin. Meat-eating, illicit sex, gambling, intoxication. And then there's a fifth uh, principle, hoarding of gold. So you take these ingredients together, you'll definitely see a conspiracy in this world, how it's going on. You know, how the sinful activities are being uh, propagated all around the world. Uh, how people are uh, becoming ensnared by these sinful principles. How they're becoming weakened. They're uh, being turned into two-legged animals and thus they're being easily manipulated by those who have money, those who are hold, hoarding gold. And that's a special place where Kali resides. And the personality of Kali, he's a big demon. His genealogy is explained in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. He's a powerful demon. So he manifests in the intelligence of uh, people who hoarding, are hoarding gold. And uh, he gives them inspiration to do demoniac things. And he, his agents are lust and anger and greed and all of that. The, these personified beings are controlling people's minds. So this is going on. Kali's pulling all the strings. But these, these people who are propagating these conspiracy theories, they can see something of it. They can see that some this or that string is being pulled. But because they themselves are not in control of their senses. They themselves are also victimized by Kali. And they themselves are also involved in sin. So they cannot see perfectly. So then they try to pinpoint the arch conspirator, David Rockefeller or the Jews or somebody else. They try to lay the whole blame on some, somebody they can see, some visible personality or, per, or group of persons in this world. But they're they're sadly wrong because even though they may point out someone who's, who's an agent of Kali who's very influential in propagating Kali's mission those persons are also uh, bewildered and controlled by something higher than themselves so uh, actually this tantrism as I've described it, tantrism in three phases. This is also Kali's, part of Kali's conspiracy. Then that means all these people who are giving these, these weird ideas of, you know, conspiracy, they, they, have, they have their whole worldview, their whole Purana of what's going on, uh, mysterious esoteric information uh, about people from other planets coming down and getting involved with the government. This is also part of Kali's plot. This is, this is also under control of Kali. The whole thing is in the, in other words, the whole thing is in the mode of ignorance. Huh? And those who, uh, uh, who accept this line, uh, these w stories, these wild tales coming out, then they go down a blind alley uh, of the mode of ignorance. They end up uh, totally uh, bewildered, deluded, totally in a state of paranoia. What's going on? <laughs> Their whole intelligence becomes blocked. And they live in a fantasy world. A world of dark shadows. <laughs> so this is all the mode of ignorance. They become stunned, immobile, 
Uh, they're living in, yeah, in a dream. Whether the dream is the materialistic dream or the functionless dream or the dualistic dream, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, these, these different groups are in each other's throats also. They're accusing one another of being, you know, also being part of the conspiracy. But they're all in the same, they're all in the same boat. So this is the, this is the mode of ignorance. This is the fate of those who have uh, uh, been captured by demoniac mentality. Krishna says, Aneka chitta vibranta moha jala samavrata prasakta kama boge shu. Patanti Narake Suchao. So Krishna says they are uh, uh, perplexed. Uh, the, these demons are simultaneously uh, perplexed on one side by so many problems, and on, on the other side, they're agitated by so many material desires. Uh, they have their desires to enjoy, and they have the problems. So they're, in this way they become bound up in a network of illusions. This is a very uh, appropriate language for understanding what's going on in the material world today. They're bound in a network of illusions. And also this whole theory of conspiracy so on. It's another kind of illusion. Huh? And thus they take shelter repeatedly again and again of sense gratification. This is the shelter of the demons. Sense gratification. You know, all these, uh, these, these, these persons who speak about the dangers of the conspiracy, one world government taking over, what, what, is, their, what is their banner? What, what, do they, what do they consider is the right path? They always quote the American Constitution. You know, we have to go back to the Constitution, they always say. Because mostly these guys are coming from America. They say, our constitution is being betrayed. Like the con constitution is their sacred document. And how does this begin? It begins, the constitution, the preamble, begins with the philosophy that the purpose of life is to pursue happiness, which means sense gratification. <laughs> so this is what they say is the right path. Sense and this is what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. They're bound up by a network of illusions. And to, uh, in trying to get out of this network of illusions and delusions, they always take shelter of sense gratification. And this is patanti narake suchau. This is the path to hell. So they're all going to hell. <laughs> so what's the use of all this? This is my question. <laughs> all these guys are on their way to hell. <laughs> so what's the use of it? So, uh, now as I said, there may be, you know, they, they come up, they're presenting so much information, uh, beings from outer space coming down in UFOs. This all may be true because it's in the, it's in the Vedic scriptures, it's in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that below the earth there are powerful asuras. And just in the regions, just above the earth, there's the yakshas and the rakshashas and the gandharvas, and they come down to earth and go back. And they have their, and also throughout the universe, there are these spheres of travel. This is another interesting point. They're called panta, like there's Brahma Panta, the path to Brahma Loka. It's a path through the whole universe. And powerful mystics know how to use this path. They can go from earth to Brahma Loka, like that, ascend to the uh, uh, cosmic sphere. And there are other pantas that are used by different demigods, different beings. The Yakshas and Rakshashas, they have their pantas above the earth. And that's, you know, these rockets when they go up in space and circle around, they're just getting situated on one of these pantas. And then they're spinning, they don't, then they don't need any more power anymore, they just spin automatically around. So these demoniac scientists, they have discovered some of these things. So, uh, these pantas, and maybe, maybe they're also meeting some Yakshas, Rakshashas, Asuras, and they take them to be, you know, the greys and the, the large nose greys and the <laughs> etc. <laughs> it's not surprising. But then on the other, uh, 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 wait, before going to the other side, I'd like to say I I know I've seen I've seen books that have been written by serious people, not these wackos like Ananda, but serious people 
who have done investigation, and they know for a fact that uh, American government, although they say there are no flying saucers and UFOs, they know that they're um, they're still studying this phenomena, and sometimes these these things, whatever they are, they're coming down on on Air Force bases where they keep nuclear missiles. This is a fact because government records show that this is going on. But on the other side, so so there is something factual. But on the other side, you know, there's a, there's a lot of delusion because all these people are in Maya. This is the point. All these there may be something going on, but those observing it, they're all in Maya. So what can they understand of it? Just like we know, uh, if if someone comes here, wants to give a class, he comes here off the street, you see, off the streets of Copenhagen, and he walks in the temple and says, "I'd like to give the Bhagavatam class." <laughs> And we say, well, who the hell are you? you, know? <laughs> you know, he's smelling of, of, of liquor. He's, he's dirty. <laughs> you can say, he's sinful. So you have no right to speak on Srimad Bhagavatam. You can have, because you can have no realization. Because your senses are uncontrolled. So we understand that about spiritual subject matter. But ultimately everything is spiritual. Everything has to be understood from the spiritual point of view. Otherwise it's not real. It cannot be a real understanding. So any type of phenomena, subtle material phenomena, unless one is sense controlled, you cannot understand it properly. So all these people, they're not sense controlled. Their minds and senses are, are uh, full of ignorance and they're seeing something and then they speculate and they come up with all kinds of wild theories. So this is also going on. Nobody, nobody can say with certainty what is really happening. And you see all these a lot of the, a lot of these uh, theories of this Ananda person. I, I was reading the the packet of information that Chiranjeev gave me. It all comes from this channeling, you know, which is some new age thing where there's some medium and some voice. He contacts some voice, so it's supposed to be some wise person somewhere. And I read, I read the what this channeling uh, entity is telling. You know, it's first of all, it's Mayavadi philosophy. <laughs> In the very beginning, they're saying, you know, that uh, Jesus, Buddha, and Krishna were all messengers of the one absolute. <laughs> this is pure Mayavadi philosophy. <laughs> and then he proceeds to tell all kinds of fantastic things about the people from outer space and what different planets they're coming from and their whole plan and the, and the plan to take over the universe. This is all coming from channeling, which is all, this is just ghost worship. And this is another phase of Tantra, ghost worship coming in contact with ghostly... There's so many different kinds of ghostly entities. You know, and they... they and, and the funny thing them, them, is that these people themselves, this Ananda and all these other guys, William Cooper, whoever they are, they also say, you cannot believe... <laughs> you cannot believe these beings from outer space, or you cannot... You know, there's so much lying. They themselves admit this. Yes, it's a fact. The subtle plane is full of this illusion, lying, cheating. So they're coming in contact with this uh, and uh, this weird information is being spread through them. So it's just all illusion. It's all, as I said, leading down a blind alley. It's all useless. <laughs> so, therefore, the conclusion is we have our own path. We have our own panta, the Goranga panta, the path of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, we have our own, uh, from the Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, our own explanation of what's going on in this world. We have our own agenda of what to do about it. We have our own solution for world problems. This is book distribution and Harinam Sankirtan and Prasadam distribution and establishment of temples, uh, Krishna temples everywhere, in every town and village. So we have enough to do. <laughs> and we have seen, by practical experience, in the history of this Krishna consciousness movement uh, in the West, that this is actually uh, clearing the consciousness and bringing people to the point of uh, real and transcendental happiness. So this is actually the solution. Uh, this is Krishna consciousness process, process just simply flushes out this whole mode of ignorance culture that's spread all over the world. 
So we should fix ourselves on this. And as far as all this other stuff, you know, it it really leads nowhere. They have no solution. <laughs> the channel master says, uh, <laughs> he says the solution is is to meditate on the white light. <laughs> And then you'll be protected from the UFOs. <laughs> this is, it's, you know, all they're doing is propagating the same garbage. They can, you know, it all comes down to the same thing, the same tantric mayavari nonsense. That's, you know, they point their fingers at others and say, they're the ones, they're the ones. But then when they give their solution, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's some phase of tantra, karma, jnana, or, or perverted bhakti, but it's, comes to the same thing. Worship the material energy. Be in Maya. Be a Maya Vadi. Uh, and this is this is the this is the uh, fundamental disease of the Kali Yuga. So all these people are Kali Chela. They're all disciples of the personality of Kali. They're all getting their power from him. They're getting all their information from him. And the whole purpose is just to lead people further and further into darkness. And this Hare Krishna movement is the only movement on the face of the earth today. <laughs> I sound like one of those guys now. <laughs> the only movement on the face of the earth. Yeah, exactly. What the Christians think of when they say Satan is actually the personality of Kali. But the Christians themselves are under his control. Mm-hmm. So these uh, agents of Kali, they are not necessarily conscious that they are so? No. Maybe some of them are. You know, they, they say that some, some few people make a pact with the devil and the, the devil comes. I, it do, doesn't mean to see that, I don't mean to say that they meet the personality of Kali, but maybe one of his big agents or something, some big demon. So these kind of people, perhaps, they're being consciously employed. <coughs> but most people are not. Because most people, it's simply a question that they're, they're addicted to sense gratification. That's Kali's, uh, pers- that's his, uh, you know, that's his reward. That's his, his uh, sweetener for everyone. Sense gratification. So people today are very much addicted to sense gratification. And... To get the sense gratification, they came. Uh, they come under Kali's control. Because then we also find the statement, Prabhupada, if I'm correct, that there are many demons in this dispensation. Did you say is that true? Well, everyone's coming from uh, that background. You can say the whole uh, philosophy, uh, the whole uh, society, is under the control of demoniac philosophy. So we come to this movement with demoniac mentality, but this movement is meant to purify that mentality. And Bhakti you Nautaku know, speaks about also this, this ext- expression you make, uh, mentioned Kali Chela, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And that is supposed to be Vaishnava's Dodi uh, Chela. Yeah, well, he's referring to the uh, Appa Sampradayas. That well, there, you know, that's natural. That that even in the ISKCON movement, it's not a question of infiltration, uh, as it is a not as much a question of infiltration as it is a question that uh, we come to this movement. We have a north is in our heart, and uh, we may make an attempt to clean these anarthas out, but due to uh, you know, lack of uh, careful adherence to the principles. Due to becoming careless, we uh, commit the offenses against the holy name, and then these anarthas start to grow again. And if we become again attached to these anarthas, you see, this this is the thing that happens. There's the bhakti lata bij in the heart, and there's these anartha bijas in the heart. So, if one is practicing Krishna consciousness properly then the anartha bijas are smothered. They're prevented from growing. And the uh, bhakti lata, the creeper of devotion, grows. But when one is committing offenses due to carelessness, then the creeper of devotion is smothered. 
and some other creeper or creepers start to grow. And then if one becomes again seduced by Maya, again, you know, persuaded that uh, in a subtle way, like Srila Prabhupada says, the sahajyas, uh, they, uh, trans uh, uh, they transform Krishna consciousness into sense gratification. So when a person starts to accept sense gratification again in the name of Krishna consciousness, then this means that there's an anartha bija growing in his heart and he thinks it's the bhakti lata bija. He thinks that that thing developing in his heart is Krishna consciousness. But it's not. It's some form of sense gratification which outwardly resembles Krishna consciousness. Just like among plants, you know. Uh, plants of different species can, can look very much similar. You know, there's... Uh, the only thing that comes to mind right now is mushrooms. <laughs> People go out and they pick mushrooms because they like to eat them. But uh, poisonous mushrooms, there are species of poisonous mushrooms which very much resemble an edible mushroom. And sometimes they pick the poisonous mushroom and cook it up and eat it and die. So it's like that. They're confusing a poisonous anarta lata, anarta creeper with the bhakti lata. And they cultivate that. And they're wearing tilak and dhoti, but they're not Vaishnavas. The sense gratifiers. So these are the Appasampadayas. So, uh, yes, it's not surprising that if in Iskan this phenomena is manifesting also. It has manifest. We have seen these unauthorized branches come out of the Iskan movement already. But this comes from offenses. It's not... I mean... It's, it's more it's more that than some you know conscious demon entering the Hare Krishna movement and <laughs> and and all the time he's conscious of you know that, that I'm really a demon and <laughs> but yet he practices Krishna consciousness and, and tries to subvert the movement from within there have been some people who have attempted to do that but they you know they're immediately exposed. But the, the other thing is much more subtle. Uh, first one is sincerely trying to be a devotee. But because of carelessness, he makes offenses. And because of his offenses, then he becomes deluded and begins to and, and mistakes sense gratification for Krishna consciousness. And goes on under false ego considering himself to be a devotee. But he's not a devotee. He's not up to standard at all. And then he branches off, he makes his own movement, whatever, gets his own followers. And then he's saying, the, the ISKCON movement is not bona fide and my movement is bona fide. Like this. Another question? Mm -hmm. so, so this Christianity, that was the, that was the primary Bhakti reflection in time, was it? Yeah, that's, that's Bhakti in the mode of ignorance. So it's another form of Tantra. And then... I, I didn't quite get what is what does this tantra itself? What does it mean? Tantra means book in Sanskrit, and uh, it can have a general meaning. You can call any book tantra, you know. But in this particular <coughs> usage, it's referring to the books known as agama, which are esoteric books of some tradition. And as I said, we also. We have our own, we have in, in uh, the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya a Vaishnava a Tantra, which which is there in the deity worship. It's the tradition of deity worship. But this is in Shuddha Sattva, so it's all right. But in the mode of ignorance, there's a Tantra too. This is all this esoteric stuff, so much esoteric stuff, and all this modern, modern New Age stuff going on this is also the same thing tantra new in a new form that means to follow all this esoteric yeah it's all in the mode of ignorance it's all coming under the control of uh, Lord Shiva and Goddess Durga uh, they have their you know they have so many followers so many agents so many 
And in this particular age, the Kali Yuga, the big prominent agent is the personality of Kali. So he has carte blanche in this age. He can just run wild, do whatever he likes. So, mm -hmm. so the agents of Kali, you say, the lost and greed, at least they influence the intelligence or mind of people. Yes. That, that means that the influence is over everyone. Yes, worldwide. And and sense gratification is being propagated in the media, uh, newspapers, television, films, everywhere, music. The ideology of sense gratification is being propagated to agitate, to bring people under the control of lust, anger, greed, madness, illusion, envy. All this propagation. So this is all Kali's conspiracy. Are they also like subtle entities? Yes, yes, yes. Millions of them. <laughs> yes, they're everywhere. Ghosts are everywhere now. So also if there's a person who's saying like deviating <coughs> because of inattentiveness and freedom. So there's a different, is there a difference between someone who is weak and like innocent and someone who is directly um, on the on the wrong path and how to deal with Yeah, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati have indicated three, there's three kinds of offenders to the holy name. There are those who are, uh, uh, what is the word, achakitsya, yeah, achakitsya. And this means they're incurable. This means they're, you know, they're really, their hearts are hard. Uh, they uh, have a completely exploitative view of the process of devotional service. It's a means for them to fulfill their material desires, to become important, to exploit others like that. Beca so they become false guru. They become, you know, big sahajya, pseudo Vaishnava. So, achakitsya, incurable. Then there's um, those who are ignorant and those who are weak. These are the other two classes. So the ignorant means like uh, uh, people who come to Krishna consciousness movement. They're coming from a very uh, difficult background. They're very dull and foolish and not very inclined to spiritual life at all. But somehow there's an attraction due to association with devotees. They become a little bit purified. They become a little bit attracted to chanting Hare Krishna. But they have big impediments in front of them. And it, they, it's very difficult for them to maintain the taste for Krishna consciousness. And, and they have so many you know, tendencies to bad habits. But this is, this is more like their misfortune. And then there's the weak ones. Those who are simply weak. Uh, that means... Um, uh, that you know they're 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 innocent, and uh, they can, if they stick to the principles of Krishna consciousness, they can overcome their weakness. But they have problems. It's a it's a problem of of having full faith in the process. You know somewhere there's some they have some lack of faith and that manifests in inattentiveness and in chanting or you know a sleepiness or whatever they, they they can't fix themselves firmly in Krishna consciousness so then they become plagued by this weakness by material desires so the incurables the ignorant and the weak are three classes of offenders and the danger for the incurables, uh, the danger for the, uh, sorry, the uh, weak and the ignorant is that they can fall under the influence of the incurables. You see, the incurable ones, these are the ones who really go all out. I mean, they're, uh, they're not sincere at all about Krishna consciousness. They're using it as a means to fulfill their own ends, their own program. So they pose themselves to be devotees and they're looking for followers so they can get some 
good followers among the the ignorant and the weak uh, because the ignorant and the weak in the in the in the practice of their krishna consciousness you know say let's make it very practical we have ignorant and weak devotees in iskon you know devotees who have problems uh, so and they're wondering why do i have problems you know why is it i can't get it together and then you get some one of these incurable fellows who's maybe gone away from iskon or in the process of going away from iskon and he's accusing uh, iskon or iskon leadership or whatever as being uh, wrong as being false misguided and he's making some propaganda like this that this is why devotees are having problems in this movement because of because of that and then the incurable uh, the uh, the uh, the ignorant and the weak they listen to these incurables and they think oh yes oh maybe what he's saying is right hmm maybe i should follow him so this this has been seen mm -hmm. also sometimes it's very difficult to uh, to see like when, at least for myself to see when one makes offenses so they were one thing as another mission mistake is how much one does for the spirit of master that shows if one is on the right path <laughs> that's the only measurements well that's not the only there's guru shastra sadhu but uh, we can know uh, that we are advancing in Krishna consciousness if we are pleasing spiritual master because spiritual master uh, Shastra is is passive Shastra is the ultimate standard but Shastra is passive means uh, you have to go to Shastra and read and understand Shastra with your mind now if your mind is contaminated <laughs> then you may not understand the Shastra properly this is the problem <laughs> because a Shastra won't the Shastra won't speak to you in that sense, you know, like you open the page and then the Shastra starts telling you, you're in Maya. Do you know that? You know? <laughs> if you're intelligent, you read the Shastra properly, you can understand that, oh, here I, according to this, I must be in Maya because I've always understood things in another way. So spiritual master, <clears throat> he's, he's active, like there's book Bhagavata and person Bhagavata, that's the spiritual master. So he's, he's actually there to point it out to us when we cannot see it. That you're in Maya. Or you're doing very nicely. So uh, Srila Prabhupada says, especially for the new devotee, neophyte devotee, the spiritual master, is his position is all important. Uh, so Shastra is there and Sadhu is there, but we may misunderstand in our ignorance. So Guru assumes an all-important role to, to point out our, our mistakes and our good qualities to us. That we should strengthen our good qualities. That's why I mentioned this the other day. Chaya Bega Dovin, Chaya Dosha Chodi, Chaya Guna Deha Dashi, Chaya Satsanga. So there's uh, uh, 12 inauspicious things mentioned that spiritual master should help us overcome the Vegas, the passions, in other words, and the... Uh, the faults six kinds of pushings or passions six kinds of faults we have to be uh, we have to overcome by mercy of spiritual master and six good qualities uh, and six kinds of transcendental association we should cultivate under the direction of spiritual master so one who's pleasing spiritual master by developing the good qualities and developing good association uh, then he's he's safe he's secure and one who displeases the spiritual master then everything finished that's a yes ya prasada bhagavad prasada mm -hmm. could you kindly clarify uh, this uh, verse when you mentioned the two bhagavatas this verse from the bhagavatam which says that when you serve the book of the person then practically all anathas go away but why is it only practically yes because finally it's up to Krishna uh, that verse uh, what is it Nityam Bhagavata Sevya Yasya Prayasya Badrishu Nityam Bhagavata Sevya Bhagavati Uttama Shloki 
bhaktir bhavati naishtiki. So, nashta uh, badreshu. So, the dirty things in the heart become practically nullified. So, that means that one can become nicely situated by serving devotee and serving Srimad Bhagavatam. One can become nicely situated in uh, bhakti yoga lifestyle, uh, vaidhi bhakti, uh, uh, become a regular devotee. But to become fully Krishna conscious, in other words, to ascend to the platform of seeing Krishna face to face, that's up to Krishna. So that uh, you know, there's, there always remains a little, a little bit of ignorance that separates us from Krishna. No matter how much we do, there will be that little bit of ignorance that only Krishna can remove. And when does he do that? When he feels like it. <laughs> it's up to him. That has really, I mean, that you cannot calculate. That's like the, that's the X factor, like in a mathematical equation, the factor X. It has no uh, no assigned value. You you cannot uh, you cannot predict it. So it's it's a matter of Krishna's mercy. Krishna can remove that obstruction, that screen of Maya which separates someone from him. He can remove it immediately in a very unqualified person if he wants. A person who's not even properly situated in the principles of bhakti yoga. There have been stories to that effect. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, especially, did like this. And then someone who's who's become very qualified uh, by serving <coughs> Guru and adhering to Srimad Bhagavatam, he's very purified, very qualified. Still, he may not get Krishna's mercy. For a long, long time. But the point is, if he's a good devotee, then he accepts that. We read the prayers of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, like this nice song, Gopinath. That's the whole expression. He's, he's praying, is it, your, is it your will to keep your servant <laughs> in illusion? <laughs> is this what you want, O Gopinath? <laughs> In so many songs, Bhakti Mnod Thakur expresses like that. I, in any case, I am your servant. Whatever you want to do with me. You want to keep me in Maya? All right. <laughs> you want to keep me in material consciousness? What can I do? So such devotee, he remains engaged in devotional service. And this is, this is vipralamba, intense separation. He de- actually, he develops this intense mood of separation from Krishna. And then when Krishna is satisfied... Then he reveals himself as to his devotee. Yes? What is the, uh, the personal ambition of Kali? The personal ambition of Kali? Is to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is his fun. Everybody's a servant of Krishna. No, he's a demon. He's a demon. But he's uh, empowered. He's empowered demon. His family line comes from Brahma. It's described in the fourth canto. So he's very, very powerful. And he has a certain role. There's a certain time arranged by Krishna the Kali Yuga, when he gets all kinds of shaktis and he can take over this earth and just run wild, do whatever he likes. But it's only for this time period. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Yes. You mentioned that the new age uh, movement is in the wake of the hippie movement and also this time period. But also sometimes you hear that uh, you know, it's in the way that Sri Prabhupada's books also, also this New Age movement pops up. 
<laughs> you want to say that they're inspired by Srila Prabhupada's books? Mm, I mean, they're like, I mean, they have a vegetarian, they have to some sort of spiritual uh, search and like this. It's not something. It's all Maya, buddy. All How can that have something to do with Srila Prabhupada's books? Hmm? Well, if you argue that they, they are <coughs> reading Prabhupada's books and they like the principles, but they're not able to follow, then they make a concoction which is in between material and spiritual life. And that could be an <laughs> no, but those people we know who they are. But these people who are concocting, I mean, what you're saying there does not explain all this nonsense that's going, all this channeling, all these weird books uh, that are just filled with speculations that have nothing to do with Krishna. It doesn't explain that. People who read Srila Prabhupada's books and cannot follow, then they, they're some kind of devotee. They accept Krishna. This is the effect of Srila Prabhupada's books. That people become some, at least some kind of devotee of Krishna. They accept Krishna as the supreme absolute truth. All this other stuff is uh, coming from another direction. It is certainly a time of heightened awareness. That facility is being given because it's, it's like something is opening in people in people's consciousness so that something can go through. This is what's happening. Something is opening. The, the mind is being expanded everywhere so that something can come through, some information can come through. And we want that information to be Prabhupada's books. There's a general increasing interest in, you know, yoga, mysticism, all that. So uh, we can connect with that interest. Here is Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, spiritual literature from India. Oh! Very nice, I'm interested. So this is, a, this is their good fortune. But at the same time, there's all kinds of, uh, yeah, these tantrics, and they're shoveling their garbage through the same <laughs> opening. <laughs> this is all Mayavadi. So this is the big competition. This tantric Mayavadi philosophy, which is in the mode of ignorance. It's always like that since the history of the world. You have these two poles, you might say. Two uh, poles of, of uh, mm, I, I hesitate to say spiritual knowledge because one is not spiritual. <laughs> but what appears to be to people to be spiritual knowledge. You have that coming from Vishnu and that coming from the Shiva side. The Vaishnavas and the Shaivites or the bhaktas and the shaktas. Uh, so in the mode of ignorance, the followers of Lord Shiva and Goddess Durga. And uh, the mode of goodness, the Vaishnavas. So that's been going on since the history of the world. And, and who, who are the worshippers of Lord Shiva and Goddess Durga? These are the asuras, the demons. And they get power from that. Now ultimately, Prabhupada says, there's a real conspiracy for you. <laughs> there is a conspiracy of cooperation between Lord Vishnu and Lord Shiva. That Lord Vishnu is making available to those who are who have the sense to become his devotees, the opportunity to take up devotional service and go back home, back to Godhead. And then Lord Shiva is making available to those who are opposed to devotional service the opportunity to become materially very powerful and influential. So then those demons, they become very powerful. And then Lord Vishnu destroys them. And by destroying them, the demons are liberated. So this is, this is explains, you know, Hiranyakashipu, Ravana, they were opposed to the Vaishnavas, they were worshippers of uh, Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma too. And they became powerful. And then they were destroyed by Vishnu. So this is all part of Lord Vishnu's, Lord Krishna's Leela. So that's going on today. There are demons becoming powerful, following this tantric path. And they are soon to be destroyed as this Krishna consciousness movement <laughs> comes up everywhere. All right, it's after eight. Hare Krishna, Shri Prabhupada, Ki Jaya.